and welcome to Moonshot, a show by Sequoia India and Southeast Asia that profiles innovative startups and inspiring founders who are dreaming big, making an impact, and driving change across the region. I'm your host, Dewi Fabri, and throughout this podcast, we'll be introducing you to founders and thought leaders who are helping shape the region's startup ecosystem. We hope this podcast will give you fresh ideas on how to start and scale an enduring company. Eruditus is a global leader in the $280 billion global professional education market. The company, which was started in Mumbai in 2010, has partnered with prestigious universities like Harvard, MIT Sloan, Columbia and Cambridge to deliver online executive education courses in multiple languages. Currently, students from over 80 countries are enrolled with them. The company, which employs over 1,500 people globally, became a unicorn in August 2021. In this episode of Moonshot, Ashwin Damera, the co-founder and CEO of Eruditus, talks with Sequoia India Managing Director G.V. Ravi Shankar about what it takes to build a diverse, high-performance team with employees all over the world. This conversation took place during a session at Surge, a rapid scale-up program for early-stage startups. Ashwin, welcome and thanks for joining us today. I want to start by acknowledging that we are so proud of many of our founders who are building a business for the world uh, in every sense of the word. One of the companies we partnered in, Freshworks, went public recently. And today we are here with you, also a special founder building for the world on Zoom, of course. I want to start with the story of the Chinese bamboo tree, which actually reminds me of you and your journey and everything you've achieved. I don't know how many of you uh, know about the Chinese bamboo tree. Apparently, when you plant the seed of the Chinese bamboo tree, it doesn't sprout for the first year, maybe not even for the first couple of years. You water it, you give it fertilizer, give it some light, but it doesn't show visible progress for a period of time. You get to see real progress from the fifth year. And at that time, when it starts growing, you will see in a period of just six weeks, it grows by almost 90 feet. So much so that you can literally watch it grow in front of your eyes during the day. I actually heard the story from the former Indian captain Rahul Dravid when he spoke about it and asked a very interesting question. Did the bamboo tree grow in six weeks or did it grow in five years and six weeks? Because for the first five years, you're not really seeing visible action, but you're seeing very strong roots being laid, a strong foundation being formed that allows this in the next six weeks to grow so rapidly. And the takeaway for me from the story is patience, faith, and perseverance. And while your story, Ashwin, may not be as dramatic, the truth is for the first five years or six years, not many people had really heard about Eruditus as a company. Of course, when you announced the most recent fundraise at $3.2 billion of valuation, the whole world now started noticing Eruditus for what it's become. But you were growing silently at your own pace in the early days, uh, you know, up until this big bang. So for, for the benefit of those that may not be really familiar uh, with Eruditus in this batch of search uh, founders, maybe let's start with 30 seconds on what our product is and what market we are going after. And then we can take it forward from there. Eruditus is kind of a two-sided uh, marketplace. On one side, we have universities who create courses, mostly non-degree courses or short courses on new age topics, digital marketing, design thinking, UI, cybersecurity, fintech, blockchain. It's a bunch of those kind of courses. We help them create it. We put it on our platform. We market and enroll. And on the other side, we have students, uh, in the, the individuals or businesses who are enrolling in these courses. At the end of it, you get a university certificate. In some courses, you get university alumni status or alumni benefits. And in some of our courses, you also get a degree. So we are helping, basically, we're helping universities go online and reach the world. 70% 70 of our students are outside the U.S., about 20% in India, 20% in Latin America, about 15% in Europe, about 5% in China. So fairly global. We offer our courses in Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, also Arabic, looking to do Turkish and French. Uh, So we offer it in different languages because our mission is to make high quality education, accessible and affordable. And a big part of access is also language. So I really want to take back uh, Ashwin to, to the roots because you know it's it's kind of, most of the learnings are there. I think the excitement is here when we talk about it publicly, but most of the lessons learned are in that early phase. But why don't you start uh, by uh, maybe talking about if your first entrepreneurial experience 
and you know some learnings from that which kind of set base for you when you decided to do uh, something in the higher education space but actually the other company you mentioned freshworks also started in 2010 And That's so their right. journey has taken eleven years. Uh, these days, we find entrepreneurs who want to become, you know, a unicorn or big, like literally in a couple of years. Uh, and some of us have had a longer journey. But my journey in entrepreneurship, like you rightly said, started in travel bureau, and I was a perfect misfit. I had no travel experience. I had no startup experience. I had no tech experience. Look, I was a kind of a banker who decided he didn't want to be a banker and went to business school to figure out what I want to do. and it so happened that i was running a business plan contest uh in business school harvard business school we came runners up we didn't win but couple of my friends who were perhaps as crazy said look we we think you're a solid guy good guy go start this we'll give you 200,000 um i had an offer with mckinsey i had 120,000 of student loan uh, everybody in my family i come from a traditional For those of you from India, South Indian family, they said, "Look, why can't you be like your brother? Just take up a job, work for five years, pay off the loan, and then do whatever you want." As though you know, the entrepreneurship idea is going to wait five years for you to pay off your loan and come back. But that's really how I got started. I uh, and you know, Travel Guru is kind of a book. I can write a book on all the things that can go wrong in a startup that went wrong. I was living in a far off place in Mumbai called Kandivli. I was sharing a room with another friend. uh so we literally you know he was working a night shift in a bpo so i would sleep on the bed in the night he would sleep in the morning and i and at a certain point i started questioning bloody hell what am i doing here right and um and i think as an entrepreneur in many times in your journey you will have that question what the hell am i doing here um and one of the things that i have i think in my dna is just perseverance i'm not going to give up i'm going to keep trying i'm going to keep trying eventually we convinced sequoia to invest i literally had maybe a month of cash month of cash left i've been in that situation by the many times in my uh, journey i'll talk about that later as well and it's a very difficult thing as an entrepreneur because you can't tell anybody else in the room that you have only one month cash left in the bank because you need them to still build product still do the marketing but you know you have very little cash in the bank in my case my two co-founders had fled so i was alone uh, so who do you talk to Uh, you and i didn't have an investor that up anyway you know ultimately you know westbridge at that time sequoia invested we started up uh, and we started building and like i said you know we had many ups and downs i think the best way to prepare for entrepreneurship is to play snakes and ladder you roll the dice you know you go up one day next day you're feeling miserable next day you go up again and of course you know there's maybe in entrepreneurship there's some skill in rolling the dice i don't think it's all pure luck and obviously that's the entrepreneur but it's it's literally like the roller coaster like you know you wake up in the morning and i i say like oh, today i'm in a good mood um and i went through all of that none of that is so important in 2008 pivotal moment we were nearly acquired by expedia uh for 75 million dollars uh the investors would have made i think a good return maybe 5x something literally in 2 3 years 4 years uh we, they spent 6 months doing diligence and they signed on their side of the uh, shareholder agreement we signed on our side it went to the lawyers escrow and then the deal blew up because lehman brothers collapsed and they said look we're not going to make any global acquisitions so that again like when big fat snake gulped me down came down again had literally a couple of months of cash left because why were we supposed to raise money you were supposed to be bought why raise money and dilute um and went through all of that experience eventually we sort of travel our city it was like i think one shift of price uh learned a lot of lessons in that journey and i think that you know a second time entrepreneur obviously is smarter than the first time some of you are smart enough that you'll get it right the first time uh but entrepreneurship is a journey and sometimes one one thing i'll tell you sometimes it's equally important to know when to let go right because when you're starting up you're so focused on the company that is everything you put in like literally 24 by 7 you're working on that but sometimes it's good to let go and i and i joke sometimes to my close circle like the companies we were competing at that time yatra and theatre have you know in the last 6 months sold for 40 million dollars and 100 million dollars or thereabouts so if i had spent 10 years going down that path i mean what a horrible outcome uh, right and in currently you know we exited that business eruditus as, as a company eruditus and emirates are doing very well and obviously i think we'll, we'll grow even more from there so anyway so that that was my story uh, an accidental entrepreneur uh to start with a travel guru but i think a more uh, a better one definitely i feel in eruditus so gv you got the version 2.2 i suppose 
Um, but also one other point I'll say that a lot of entrepreneurship is timing and luck. So as much as I say anything today, look, there's luck. You can do all that you want, but there's timing and there's luck. And so one of the things that I like to live by in this journey, I'll reflect uh, and say is, you know, you can celebrate your successes, obviously, but don't let it go to your head. Be outwardly extremely ambitious, right? I mean, aspire to do great things. And by the way, we are all only bounded by the limits of our aspiration, of our ambition. Um, I never thought eruditis would be so big. In fact, when our fun, first fundraising round, we had shown a five-year plan of 50 million. So in 2015, we were raising money. We said we'll have a revenue of 50 million in 2020. A couple of VCs actually asked me, are you missing a zero? Um, and it's very funny. We went back in Excel, put a zero, and we actually raised capital. But that's for later on story. But we're actually getting there. We're actually getting this year close to 500 million revenue. But I never saw that. So I was limited only by my own, you know, not I wouldn't say ambition, but perspective of life. So be outwardly extremely ambitious, but inwardly very modest. If you guys meet up and have the good fortune of spending time with Ashwin, you'll know he's uh, amongst the most grounded founders you'll find. Uh, I think he's ambitious, like he's saying. But maybe Ashwin, when I met you first, I didn't know whether you're outwardly as ambitious. Uh, maybe as the path becomes clearer, you know, the ambition also grows. So I, I'm, I'm, that is one of the things about uh, entrepreneurship, right? You, you need to kind of clear up your path and or point yourselves in directions where there's a much, much larger opportunity. And, you know, I've seen you do that uh, many times over. But just to round up the travel guru story and, you know, jumping into uh, your second startup, right? What are one or two things that you say, hey, I would never do this again, like never again. And then there are one or two things saying, okay, I've learned this and I'm going to implement it in my new company. One is, you know, again, you guys already started up. So maybe you already kind of boxed into this, but go after large ideas, large opportunities. Because I would, mm -hmm. I think that even if you're a very poor, uh, or let's say if you execute very poorly, but the opportunity is large, you'll still build a sizable outcome. Versus you can have a fantastic team, execute amazingly well, but if your opportunity is small, you will have a smaller term. When I say opportunity is small, it's not just about the time. It's also about whose competition, how big is the incumbent, what are your unit economics, et cetera. Right? So to give you a better analogy, let's say you're an expert kayaking person or a you know, rowing person. Um, you assemble one team with a bunch of experts. You assemble another team with a bunch of novices, people like GV and me. Right? And ask the experts to kind of paddle upstream. So they're going against the current. And measure how far they get an hour. Ask GV and me to paddle you know, downstream, we are novices. I bet you GV and I will get further than the guys who are the experts going, but they're going upstream, right? And so the talent is helpful. And of course, if the, of course, the ideal situation is you have the experts paddling downstream, right? But the point is go after very large opportunities. For us, travel in India, online travel in 2005 was a small opportunity. Of course, it's expanded before. But education, if you think about higher education, $3 trillion market, very, very, very fragmented, no large incumbent. So, you know, it has all of those elements of those five forces that Porter talks about. And the second one I will tell you is, look, cash is competitive advantage, especially in this day and age when everybody's raising so much capital. But it is true even in 2005. Uh, you know, when we raised our first, in Travel Guru, raised our first round, it was $2 million. But the guy next door raised like $20 million. And the next round, they raised $50 million. How do you compete? I mean, it's just impossible. And, you know, GV, you know that in our last round, we were going to raise $250 million with primary. We made it $450 just so that we have some more cash if we had to make some MA or go in a certain direction. So cash is important, but the best form of cash is actually from customers. It's very tempting for entrepreneurs to think that the best form of cash is from Sequoia, from Axel, or whoever else it is that you have in your list of, you know, Sequoia is a great place to raise money. But that is a form of cash. But the cash from customers is better because it also validates your model. And when you have paying customers, it tells you that you actually have product market fit. It makes it so much easier to raise money from investors. But also it gives you a leeway to build the company without too much dilution so that as owners, as founders, you have ownership. And I find that when one thing that also says a learning is in Eruditis, the founding team still owns a significant amount of the company. In Travel Guru, in my first startup, after the first few rounds, we were down to like literally like 15%, 20%. But when you have ownership, you think long term. You can think about building an enduring company. It's a phrase that I'm borrowing from GV and Sequoia. But when you're 10, 15%, you're saying, hey, let me do three, 
four, you know, three to four M and A IPO public. The the headline is what cares, but you care less. So you're caring about the output metrics. You care that's about building something that is vast, that has more, that's substantial. So just to put it briefly, go after large spaces, uncontested spaces. Uh, cash is obviously important. The best form of cash is from uh, is from your customers. Those are some of the things that I would say that. Uh, you know, you should uh, be mindful of. And one last thing, maybe say, just be careful about funding cycles. Uh, you know, you can be caught up. Today, the funding cycles are very aggressive, so you can raise money, but one day that may change. So just make sure that if you're a company that's burning cash, especially, and that's fine, right? It, not every model is going to be unit economics positive. Just manage those funding cycles carefully. Absolutely. And, <clears throat> and when those environments change in 2008, we wrote about uh, this concept called a death spiral when you start trying to cut costs and while trying to do that, you can't keep up your revenues and it just keeps going, spiraling down. So hopefully none of these uh, happen uh, and you know the life continues as is. But there is a lot of character built in those times, Ashwin, and I'm pretty sure several of those learnings have helped you as you got started um, you know, with uh, Eruditus later. So first question for you on the new journey, right? So for a long time, it, it didn't look like you guys even really wanted to raise external capital. So uh, how did you, how, you know, and you're kind of building steadily, slowly, um, what were some of the design choices you made um, and, you know, why did you choose not to go back and raise and start bigger? Because usually second time founders are like wanting to do something with a lo lot more capital, etc. In the second startup, Erudite, I was very clear I wanted to build a business that has more around it. Right? That it's not easy for somebody who raises a lot of money to come and just replicate what we're doing or acquire customers by just discounting because then that's a shitty business. Um, and so for that, we actually had to work with universities. That was a model. Now, universities are very slow moving machines. They're kind of like quasi government. So it took us a long time to convince universities to work with these two guys based somewhere in India, you know, who say they're going to kind of help them go and conquer the world in some sense. But look, who are these guys? Nobody's heard of it. And this is every founder's challenge, right? Um, luckily for us, my co-founder Chaitanya had worked at INSEAD. So INSEAD said yes, but my alma mater, Harvard Business School, took like six years to say yes, despite me coming from there. So the first year we were able to convince only one school. Then INSEAD and Wharton had a partnership. So that became the second school and so on. But also GV, we were very deliberate that we wanted to establish product market fit first before scaling. What that meant is we needed to understand our customers very close. For us, it was it was important that we're able to con able to show value to each university, um, and that required us to do one program at a time, make it succeed, and then go back and maybe say we want to do one more program. Until we were able to prove that, look, we didn't have the need to raise capital. Uh, these were classroom programs. We were very careful about unit economics, so we didn't really need the capital. The other thing I would say is. You know, we actually prefer to stay under the radar because my experience in Travel Guru is the moment you announce funding, there'll be three other guys who are saying, hey, I will do the same model and they'll go to three other VCs and they'll get funded. And then suddenly it starts to look like a crowded space, right? So we were very clear that, look, we don't need that because does that help us sign more universities? No. Does that help us get more customers? No. Do we need the cash? No. At around that time, around you know 2015, et cetera, you started seeing massive fund bases going on in the Indian ecosystem. And we did sometimes question saying, hey, are we not raising money? And is that kind of hurting the business? But we felt that that was the right decision for us. Uh, I think in 2016, we started to go online. When we went online, GV, we needed to build technology. We needed to build the courses up front. So we need a lot of cash up front. And we were marketing globally. So we had to build our global team. So at that point of time, it made sense for us to raise capital. Uh, funnily, about 20 venture capitalists said no. Uh, I was famously asked a question by one of them saying, are you a promoter or an entrepreneur? Um, and I said, look, what, what is that difference? I said, you know, you guys own 100% of the company. You're growing at 30%. You're not burning cash. You're not an entrepreneur. You're a promoter. And you know, I, I, even today, I try to understand that sentiment. Uh, but I think now that same VC will be very proud that we are entrepreneurs because we are burning a lot of cash. We're going very fast. We raise a lot of money. I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but the point is, you know, we really focus on building a solid business with good unit economics. And that has always stood us in good stead. Like even today, when we raise capital, it's not so much for burn, it's for growth. But I think our relationship with our partner schools, which we took time to nurture and build, which is the cornerstone of our business, 
is pretty solid, very difficult for other people to come in and replicate. That was because we were deliberate about the partnership and how we built it. But let no. me also caveat and say, this journey is my journey. It's a journey. It's not true for everybody. If you are in a space like, for example, FinTech or some mobile app, you may need to raise a lot of cash up front and go really fast. So you have to, as an entrepreneur, right? you have to make that decision on, the, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis based on what you're seeing in your space. Ashwin, this is great. You know, actually, you preempted my next question, which was around this concept of founder market fit, which you've spoken about in the past. But when you thought about the next business, did you think about what kind of business would you and you know suit best? And just for the benefit of the team, at least, you know, Ashwin, when I met you, for me, what was the number one thing was that you were very, very clear that your partner needs to succeed and your job and your customer was a university and you know you needed to make them successful. And that was the most important thing. And you were willing to be very patient about investing the time to kind of make it happen for them. And to the early example you mentioned about how we're taking six, seven years. I mean, I don't see many people will kind of keep the hunt as long, right? Like, you know, be like, okay, it's not working out. Let's go hunt the next one. And you were also clear that you wanted the very best of universities, right? It would have been very easy for you to go to the I don't know, whatever, some university number 25, 30 in Miami and go say, let's peddle their courses. You didn't choose to all of that. You know, your list is just so, you know, everything is Ivy, right? Like Kellogg, you know, Wharton, uh, all the names, Stanford, more recently. Like, how? Just talk talk about what it takes from a, as a founder to say, hey, this market is for me and this market is not for me. I call it the founder startup fit, right? So uh, after I had sold to travel our city, I had one year to figure out what I want to do. And I realized given my value system, right, these highs and lows of a, a startup is something that I can live with. But at the end of that, I wanted to be doing something that actually touches people's lives. And I started talking to a lot of people and being very, very, uh, you know, kind of looking at many opportunities in those two spaces. Education specifically it has very strong uh, an emotional connect and fit with me, right? Because I was the beneficiary of very high quality education. It was dimmed into my head in by my family and where I grew up that education change, you know, is transformational. Um, but also, you know, for the business that I had to build, you have to build deep relationships, trusting relationships with universities. I, in my DNA doing that, and again, I will let others maybe comment on it, but I believe that I'm an authentic person. I can build this. I would not be very successful in a kind of a red ocean market where somebody's buying market share and killing the other person, doing cashbacks and this and that. That would not be my cup of tea. But building relationships, negotiating long-term deals, delivering on that, that was my DNA. So education was a calling. I felt that was a good place to go. Uh, and so that was the sector that we zeroed in on. And then over a period of time, figured out what the right model uh, for us is. And it also you know, was mission-driven. And that actually resonates well uh, with me. And I was willing to be patient, like you said, to get there. So it's important for people to figure out, hey, am I doing something that actually fits with my core strengths, my core values? As you grow, you have to keep asking yourself about founder startup fit by stage of the company. Some people are very good zero to one. Some people are very good one to 10. Not so good 10 to 100 and horrible 100 to a billion. Right? So what I mean by that is, when in the first phase of a startup, you can walk up to somebody and say, hey, do this, do that. Hey, oh, you're good in that sales pitch. Let me figure this out. Hey, let's go and roll up our sleeves and solve this problem, blah, blah, blah. You get to 100 people, you're now in different locations. You get to 500 people, 1,000 people, you're global. And now the culture is different. Sometimes there are there is this question about, I call it box one, box two, box three, which is box one is about managing the present. Right? It's about what do I need to do today to manage the business? Box three is about what do I need to do today, but to create the business for the future? What new products, what new markets, but also as an individual leader, what new skills do I need today to be developing to lead in the future? And most importantly, box two, what do I need to get rid of? Right? So what do I need to forget? And so every startup founder has to ask yourself a question, just because you're successful today doesn't mean you'll be successful tomorrow. What got you here won't get you there. This is a philosophy of mine that, you know, look, it's true for your business model. It's true for you as an individual. And better you do creative destruction to yourself first than have somebody else come and either creatively destroy or not so creatively destroy your business. Or have your investor tell your boss, it's time for you to pack up your bags and leave. I need to get somebody else to run the business. Better you have that 
conversation, you have that reflective mode. But that's something that all of you need to ask. Some people are very good street fighters, but they may not make good generals. Right? And some people are very good general, but you know, if you hire the, such kind of people in the early stage of your startup, they will hire a massive team under them. You won't get what you want. So you need to have this founder startup fit also by stage of the company and be always very aware of that as you grow. You know, the level of self-awareness that you that you need to kind of think through saying, hey, <clears throat> what do I need for being in box three or for 10 years, five years? It's not always possible that people can do it themselves. Do you have any tips how you do it? And do you use external people? Do you have mentors? Do you talk to people to understand look, where are the gaps and where are the opportunity areas from your perspective to continue to scale to be the leader that can take this company to 10 billion, 100 billion, uh, et cetera? Even to talk to an external person, you must be self-aware to know that you need to talk to an external person. So there is no substitute for being self-aware. And that's why I say outwardly ambitious, inwardly modest. <clears throat> inwardly modest means, you know, on a Friday, reflect back and ask yourself, hey, what all did I do wrong? Or maybe putting it differently, what would I do differently? We all can do things differently, but you need to keep time for yourself. So every usually on Friday, first half is my box three time, box three and box two. What am I thinking about in the future? Hey, you know, is there a Netflix model for education that we should think about? Today, it doesn't exist. But if I want to make it exist five years from now, I need to be thinking about it today. And then box to, hey, what should I do differently? Right. So you, there's no substitute for being self-aware. Once you're self-aware, the tools are out there, right? Whether that's a mentor, whether that's a coach, whether just to talking to other people, like a co-founder sometimes is a very good mirror for you to have because they can call a spade a spade. My style is to be externally extremely ambitious, but internally, I know when I make a mistake, I don't need a mentor to tell me I made a mistake. I need a mentor to tell me how to kind of react to this, how to solve the situations, right? But you should be able to know um, kind of where your you know strengths are and where your weaknesses are. You no, know, this whole idea that you take a block of time and use it for reflection and planning is a really interesting hack. Honestly, <clears throat> you know, even for for us, some of us who tend to run from meetings to meetings, uh, you know, just having that thinking time to block either every day or through the week, some days uh, is just so much useful to just reflect and take a pause and, and look at what. You've done what you can do differently in the future. So thank you for sharing that. How do you attract all these crazy good people, right? So you've you've not just done hiring of very high quality people, but you've been able to do that everywhere from China to LATAM to where not. And you know, it always kind of uh, is mind boggling to to kind of think about that. Saying, hey, how do you get those people? How do you convince them to join you? And okay, today again, unicorn, you know, lots of big names and so on. So easier to understand who eruditis is what emeritus is and so on but you know when we didn't have this even when we didn't have this a few years ago you were able to really attract high quality talent so just talk through your talent philosophy uh first what do you aspire for uh, when it comes to talent um how do you look for them how do you convince them is there a process are there some tips and tricks that you can share with folks that are much earlier in their journeys to kind of tell them in the first few years how do you get you know high quality how do you get that expert team that's growing downstream, assuming at least directionally, we're all growing downstream. I would just say, make hiring a key talent your number one priority. Ultimately, the success of your business depends on the people who drive that business. Yes, for the early days, it's maybe you and your co-founder and the core team, by the way, you, but as you become bigger, it's the quality of the people that you hire. If you're spending 30% of your time versus if you're spending 60% of your time on hiring, right? you will see a dramatic difference between the quality of people that you have. Why is that? It's, you know, and I can tell you, by the way, it's easy for me to say this. It's very difficult to do it because 60% of your time is still a huge commitment of time. And there's so much, there's a, a fire every day in every nook and corner of the business that you have to put out. So how do you spend 60% of the time? I think of it as the bitter pill. You spend 60% of the time hiring A plus people. In three months or six months, they will put out the fires. There will be less fires. You spend 30% of time hiring people. Let's say you get average people. You will continue to spend your time putting out the fires. You will not have the time to think about box three. You will not have the time to do larger things, right? So be very clear on your priorities. If you believe you're building a great company long-term, you need to have A plus people. Why is time important? This, you know, Each of you can ask yourselves, look back on a key role that you've hired. How many resumes did you look at? How many interviews did you do, right? If you have not interviewed at least, say, 10, 15 people before you hired an important role, 
if you didn't have three candidates at the end of that who you think i could hire any one of these three then you haven't actually done the right job in hiring and i can tell you the difference between an a plus person and an average person for a startup is huge because their impact their roles are so big in your early days that amplifies so that's one thing that i'll say now the second thing is how do you go about doing this beyond just giving time uh one is you know look any hiring that you do the traditional way it's a lottery 50 50 Right. If you just do interview-based hiring, it's a fifty-fifty. And as a founder of a company, you just cannot accept fifty-fifty. So the number one thing I would say is hire from referrals. That's a ninety percent chance of success. Right? Your investors can be helpful. Hopefully, you have your own networks. But this is the other thing that I I think all of us must do. Even if you don't have the need to hire somebody, build your referrals. Right. Talk to people in the industry. Talk to people in adjacent spaces. If you get that wrong, you know it has a negative impact. So one is go on, go on the referrals. The second thing I would say is, you know, in in some cases, if you're trying to hire a very senior person and you're a smaller startup and you can't afford them, then maybe even ask them to advise you part time. They get to know you. You get to know them, and then maybe when you're a little bigger, you close your next round or you know you have your first customer win, whatever. You may be able to convince them to come on board because you know senior people always are difficult. Difficult. I always say A plus hiring. You know, if you make an offer to three A plus people, two should reject you because A plus people they have other things to do. Right. That's the nature. If you just make an offer to three and all three accept you, I doubt whether all three were A plus. So it's not going to be easy to hire them. So sometimes you need to woo them, get them part time, and then get them full time access. But be very flexible. Be very flexible on things that don't matter. Does location matter? do you need everybody to come to your office on a monday morning and you know on a friday no then you open up the world to hire great talent the last thing i would say when you want to hire a plus people always don't just talk money compensation role talk mission a plus people if you don't get them aligned to what you are trying to build and by the way as as a founder the mission whatever the mission is right that's why we get up on monday morning and feel excited to come to work i hope that's true for all of you There is nobody else who can communicate that vision with that passion than the founder, right? And when an A plus hire that you want to hear hire hears that from you, right? They will either buy into it or they won't buy into it. But to me, that is the biggest weapon in your arsenal. But the mission is something that if you can, you know, communicate and articulate well with passion, that actually attracts a lot of good people because they do want to change the world. they also want to be on a journey by 3 years 5 years they look back and feel fulfilled and feel significant in terms of what they've achieved so these are some of the things that i would say spend more time use referrals um, be the things that don't matter like title suppose you want to hire somebody as avp but they want a vp title just give it to them you're a big deal you know later on you know when you're a bigger company a hr guy will tell you that the policy and all of that right but that's for later on for right now you need that guy on the seat who's motivated right so the things that don't matter just to move from the equation advisory sometime before coming full time uh, and then the mission that's very important it's amazing it's amazing very very helpful ashwin one question though you know we constantly see this uh, there is a trade off on time you needed this person yesterday always like you know especially in young companies you know days weeks matter so much more so you come across this person who's a not a plus but they are available they can you know they can help you immediately whatever so so is that like is the, do you have like a 100% no compromise type thinking or do you say okay something's a tactical it's okay let's get him you know for the next year or two then we'll find somebody else where do you make the trade off if at all you make the trade off make the trade off on kind of the lower level hiring like if you're hiring like uh, you know sales people tele sales people or you know call center people or accounts etc those don't impact the business But if you're hiring anybody who you think, like for example, you're head of business development, a CTO, a VP marketing, not even a CMO, VP marketing, anything, any role that you think has what I call a disproportional impact on the business, don't compromise. Because in that one year that that person is there, you think you filled a job, you you think you filled a role, but that one per year that person is there will set you back a lot, not in terms of. you know the actual setback but the opportunity of the difference between that person and a plus and then you'll have to go back and have a difficult conversation by the way the biggest challenge with not hiring great people is that they will not hire great people under them so you will then sit on an org which, let's say you hire a very average sales head you will then by in the end of one year you'll have a very average sales team 
Now try go undoing that. That will take one more year to undo. Some of you may be very good at spotting and hiring talent, right? Some of you may actually figure out early that your co-founder or somebody else is actually better at that. Please make them your chief talent procurement officer and please step aside. Because, you know, for example, the, there's some of us who have conversations, we love the person just in one conversation, one of the, that's the wrong person to be making critical hires, right? Maybe you can have a panel of five, six people, but figure out very early on who is making the decisions on hiring. It better be somebody who's got a very high pitch rate. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Make sure that person at least or that bunch of people are spending a significant amount of time on hiring, which means take away not so important things from them. Remove all of that. Focus on the key thing. Hiring is a key priority. Get it right because undoing it is not easy. The great point you make, you know, one way I think about uh, this discussion on, uh, you know, should you compromise and hire somebody is what is the what is the time it's going to take to undo this decision, right? To the point that you make, you know, usually you, you hire somebody, it's going to take you three to six months to really know that person's not working if you have made the wrong hire. And then it's going to take three months of notice time, whatever, to get them out and another three months to find the person. So literally we are talking about one year lost making a bad hire. So when it feels like, hey, it's going to, I need this person urgently and, you know, I need them now, like one month, whatever. But if you could just spend another month thinking about the right person, you'd actually save yourself 10 months if uh, you got it wrong. So to me, at least, uh, you know, having that no compromise type thinking is a better answer. Um, uh, and of course, in a market like this, where talent is just so scarce, it's easier said than done. But but I think to the extent that you can keep the bar high uh, is a lot better. Ashwin, you know, uh, one one last thing on this topic, and I know this topic Hiring is one thing, but then, you know, getting them to thrive is another. So just can you talk about some leadership uh, principles that you have when it comes to managing talent? What are the things that you do uh, well to kind of help them succeed, right? Like, like holding them, you know, helping them, making them effective within what you're doing. First is when you hire really good people, uh, your job is nearly done. Get out of the way. Don't manage them. If you don't go and tell them, this is how you have to do this. This is how you have to give them autonomy. Really, and again, if you hire good people, and this is by the way, one more sign of whether you hired a good person or not. If you have to tell them what they have to do, big problem. Uh, but good managers like autonomy. They like regular feedback. And what I like to focus on in managing people is input metrics. Don't focus just on output metrics. Like for example, if there is a head of sales, Right. I'm going to look at how many meetings is that person getting? Do they have a strategy? Are they going after one or two industry verticals? Are they spraying themselves in? Are they hiring good people under them? Are they having meetings? Are they getting proposals in? They may not get a dollar, but I can give them more um, resources and say, grow. Now that person is very motivated because he or she is being measured on input metrics and is being asked to grow and create something that's even larger. Right. So one of my points to say is when you, especially when you're dealing with really good people, Feedback is very relevant. Support, autonomy is very important and then helps them grow. The last thing I'd say is just culture, right? Uh, what is the culture of the organization? By the way, this also matters as you become bigger when you hire people. Good people that you want to hire in the future will know somebody in the company. They will call them up and say, hey, what is it like to work with Ashwin? Or what is it like to work with each one of you, right? And your reputation you know, will be out there. So what is the culture that you have in the company. So I'll give you guys an example. So uh, let's say somebody comes, let's, let's take the sales example. Let's say my BD guy, Charlie comes to me and he says, look, my goal for next year is to do hundred million dollars in revenue. Okay. And Charlie doesn't do hundred million, but he does 75 million. Let's say I have one more BD guy. He says, my goal next year is to do 75 million in revenue. Same role, just assume that it's the same role, right? So somebody says I can do 100 million, but actually ends up at 75 million. The other person says I can do 75 million and actually does 75 million. Which one of these two will you promote? Assuming promotion, reward, whatever, doesn't matter. Which one of these two would you promote? By the way, this will determine the culture of your company. Just keep that in mind. You think it's, oh, it's a very simple mathematical problem, right? Uh, it's not. It will determine culture and performance. Why? Because then if the person who, who is rewarded on hitting goals is promoted, next year, what do you think the 75 million guy is going to say? Oh, my goal is 90 million. I'll 100% hit it. I get the promotion. So you will attract or you will build a culture. Not intentional, by the way. You didn't think of it this way. Now, on the other hand, if you promote the 100 million guy, you can also have somebody who gives you an amazingly crazy goal and never hits it. So there's a downside to that also. 
my own view, by the way, I'll promote the 100 million person who may have achieved 75, but who aspired for 100. Why? Because at least aspirationally, he was seeing a larger opportunity, right? And of course, if he, every year he keeps doing this, that's a problem. But I'm just saying, for me, from a mindset, that's the way I would approach it. But each of these kind of innocuous decisions that you make will build and affect your culture. Culture is not about what you say in a town hall. Right? Culture is actually mostly culture is not about what you say. It's about what you do. 70% of what people will imbibe as culture is what they observe, not what they hear. So think very carefully about these kinds of decisions, how you, you know, mix with people, all of this. But if you build a great culture, you will be able to retain and motivate strong talent. Ashwindira, these are great thought starters. Thank you. So culture reflects in every decision. Uh, that a company makes and the choices you make and in the way you run your business. But there's something many of our founders fight, find quite challenging, actually. You mentioned about goals and the tolerance for embracing failure. But a lot of people want to create these goals and actually make sure they hit them all the time uh, so that they have the credibility about you know, what they say and what they do. But how does one remain you know, reliable and predictable with the forecasts that we make, etc., without at the same time uh, in losing the boldness to take those big risks and you know be willing to fail once in a while. For me, look, our business is growing 2.5 times, right? So it's growing two and a half times. Instead of two and a half times, if we grew, say, 2.2 times, right? That's a miss. That's many million dollars of, of a miss. But should, but my philosophy is like, dude, how many businesses that you know from 180 million are going to grow 2x or 2.2x? So I'm going to celebrate that and I'm going to celebrate. That's my view. I'm just giving you my perspective that I'm going to celebrate every business person in my team who signed up for that two and a half X. Maybe they didn't deliver. And then by the way, going one step deeper into that, right, you have to understand why did you not deliver this? Like, for example, if we had to sign up a certain bunch of university partners or courses, but the universities were slowed down because they're reopening or because we couldn't film the faculty because of COVID, whatever. Those are good reasons. But but if somebody came and said, look, I just did a very bad projection and therefore I'm so sorry, that's a very different conversation, right? So I'm, I'm assuming what when I'm saying that, hey, I'm okay with kind of having aggressive goals and missing them, it really means well thought out aggressive goals, missing that, that's okay. What I'm really telling you is what kind of a team do you want? Somebody who's aiming to hit a home run, but may get three strikes or somebody who's just hoping to tap the ball and run to first base. That's the question I'm trying to ask you guys. What do you want? And the answer will vary from company to company. By the way, just to give an example, three or four years from now, if you're a public company, I want the guys who tap the ball and run to first base. Because if you're a public company and you miss your numbers, that's brutal. And this is why zero to one, one to 100, 100 to 1,000, you need different mindsets. Right? But for us today, given the growth that we have, I want the home run hitter. Honestly, every time I talk to you, Again, just reminded of uh, what it takes to build a special company and 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 the founder startup fit as you talk about uh, you know which is so evident um, you know there's lots lots of takeaways and different people took away different things I'm sure but at least for me uh, the desire to play long term um, the desire to kind of not focus on tactics but focus on principles and just staying core to that um, whether it's about not budging and hiring a plus talent not taking shortcuts when it comes to you know hitting numbers etc just those are things that uh, are very special and uh, you know again want to say the the tips and and strategies you shared in general about kind of how to think about hiring how to think about managing global teams even the very simple thing that uh, you know don't put location constraints on people that suddenly just takes away the quality of talent you can get from anywhere in the world these are all very important uh, you know takeaways at least for me super uh, enjoyed this conversation and thank you really uh, you know, on behalf of uh, all of us, that's been a wonderful uh, conversation. Thank you so much, Ashwin. I do want to say, guys, you know, Sequoia has been an integral part of both my journeys and I couldn't have been more fortunate. So a lot of it is also luck. This is one of the lucky things that I've had. And especially with GV, I have somebody whose value system, you know, I think will be friends beyond this startup. And that's to me an enduring value that I have beyond building an enduring company. But Sequoia is, is literally like that. They're like an extended family. So you guys are in great hands. Good luck to all of you. Your journey is your own. I Look, I'm one example of one person who seems to have done decently. Okay, but your journey is your own. Enjoy it. It'll have its ups and downs, but at the end of it, you should be able to reflect back and say you had a you know journey that was well worth it. So good luck. 
Those were some great insights from Eruditus co-founder and CEO Ashwin Damera. He was speaking to GV Ravi Shankar, Managing Director at Sequoia India. For more startup stories, visit our website sequoiacap.com or follow us on Spotify. I'm Dewi Fabri and you've been listening to Moonshot.